excitement in Westminster, we now turn to the real scene of the action, which is our keynote address by uh, Professor uh, Sir John Curtis. I'm not going to talk at great length about how wonderful he is. He is wonderful. You know he's wonderful. <laughs> and, he's, and he's going to give you lots of insights. John Curtis. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm not a great fan of conspiracy theories, but I'm wondering if this afternoon has, was May's revenge. <laughs> that um, she, she saw on the um, programme for today that I was down to speak at 2.30, and she said, I know what I'm going to do to that bastard that uh, came up with the exit <laughs> poll. I'm going to scupper his talk. But anyway, we were forewarned and therefore were able to take action. Um, I should also say that I decided about 72 hours ago that it was absolutely impossible to come up with a talk that might be framed to uh, fit whatever particular state of play we might be in as of 2.30 this afternoon and, of course, the decision eventually to uh, hold uh, the not the meaningful vote uh, this afternoon, um, uh, only added force to that. So what I'm going to do is to, for the moment... I mean, actually, I'm, what I'm going to do is to talk about some of the research that uh, I've been funded to do uh, via the UK and the Changing Europe programme, thanks to the ESRC, um, and to that extent, as it were, this is slightly more straight down the line, this is what we've discovered, etc. Uh, research based on a single source, rather than, as I sometimes do, try to pull data across um, uh, uh, multiple sources. But for those of you who got up rather early on Tuesday morning to hear me in uh, the House of Commons, well, if you want to go and watch the um, uh, parades outside, uh, please feel my guest, because you're not going to learn anything new. Um, OK, what I'm going to do, well, I, we have been uh, funded to do by the ESRC, who I think, you know, one should say, I mean, people will know that I'm not always the ESRC's greatest fan, but in the tide of academic history in this UK, the ESRC's decision before the 2015 general election to say that there should be an initiative on the UK in a changing Europe. Yeah, no, there might be a referendum, but you know, this is a subject worth doing anyway. Um, did prove to be an extraordinarily prescient uh, decision. Um, and uh, of course, that therefore meant that actually two days before the 2015 election, which of course is the outcome that paved the way to the referendum and everything else that goes thereafter, you know, an election that uh, not even David Cameron expected to get an overall majority in, um, that we were all up and ready and running the moment that the referendum became a possibility. And then let me also say, I think that the way in which Annan Menon has run this project uh, uh, ever since has been absolutely um, exemplary. And I think we all are in a great, great of attitude for the way in which she has uh, ensured that the ability of British social science to contribute to this debate across a very, very wide range of issues um, has been so successful. Anyway, what am I going to do? I'm going to, I, I've been funded in particular as part of this uh, exercise to look at two uh, particular ways of data collection. One is relatively novel. This is using the um, random probability mixed mode panel that Natsen run, which is code for, this is a bit better than you, Gov, but it's a compromise with the real world. Um, it's essentially, these are people who were initially interviewed by British Social Attitudes. They are therefore selected at random. They are not volunteers in any sense, but who at the end of that interview have said, look, I'm willing to do further follow-up interviews, either or online or perhaps over uh, uh, by the telephone. And we started interviewing these folk in September 2016. And we've been, as you can see, been doing so on an occasional basis ever since. And we've essentially had two foci. One foci has been, uh, one focus has been um, to look at what people wanted out of the Brexit negotiations. And that's where we started from. And then subsequently, we've shifted on to what people have been making of the Brexit negotiations. So what I'm going to offer you this afternoon, as it were, is really a potted history of how the British public have reacted to the Brexit negotiations and the way in which the shape of public opinion vis-a-vis -vis Brexit has or has not shifted, and, so, and a few clues 
as to why. So that's one um, exercise. Um, the other exercise that uh, we've been funded to use is British Social Attitudes, which many of you will be aware of. It's an annual high-quality survey done face-to-face, -face, all by random probability. Um, and we've got a limited set of questions on that, asked both before and since the referendum. Um, so this enables us to take an even longer time lens and to begin to raise questions about, well, how does public opinion compare now with where public opinion was at before the whole Brexit process, including the referendum, started. So um, there's no particular connection between the two halves of this talk, well, but you, might, you may see a few. So I'm going to address, using these two different uh, uh, sources of data, uh, two questions. The first is to look at how voters have reacted to the Brexit process since the referendum. So here I'm focusing in particular on the negotiations. And I'm addressing the broad question of whether or not the first phase can be regarded as success. Because one, I mean, within political science, we're very used to asking questions about the input into referendums. So we ask questions about whether or not the public are sufficiently knowledgeable in order to vote in an informed way in a referendum, or can they use various heuristics or shortcuts in order to get them there, even though they may not necessarily be that knowledgeable. So we're very used to evaluating referendums by that criterion. But we're rather less um, uh, 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 experienced and have done much less in terms of, well, actually, how successful um, are referendums in delivering the change that people are looking for? And this is a particularly important question or pertinent question for the Brexit referendum because one of the crucial characteristics of this referendum is that it, the delivering the outcome did not simply lie within the ability of the UK state. So, I mean, you're, I'm, I'm sure you all remember and were extremely excited and engaged by the referendum in 2011 on whether or not we should change the electoral system to the House of Commons to the alternative vote. Um, but the truth is that if indeed we had voted in favour, the state would have been able to deliver. It may not necessarily have had the consequences that people anticipated, but the state could have delivered the formal change. Indeed, the legislation was already on the statute book. In this instance, however, the state could not necessarily deliver. So therefore, how, insofar as at the end of the day we're going to evaluate how successful the EU referendum has been as a contributor to the democratic operation of this country, Clearly, the extent to which it does or has, has or has not met the aspirations of particularly those who voted to leave is clearly an important question. The second uh, question I'm going to look at is then looking at uh, both the combined effect of the EU referendum and the subsequent Brexit process. And in particular, I'm looking at the question of the extent to which public opinion has been polarised by the whole uh, event. And now, uh, you know, to some degree, this is something that would not surprise us. Um, we expect that as a result of holding any kind of ballot and people being invited to focus on particular issues at stake, that the structure of public opinion should be, uh, become better, better organised and that the relationship between how people say they're going to vote and their prior attitudes, that that relationship should strengthen. That's the consequence of the process of people becoming engaged in the debate and seeing the connections between different issues. But the issue I'm particularly interested in here is, well, normally we would say you, you start off with an electorate whose views are maybe not that well structured they become more structured during the campaign. They hit the height when the ballot is held. And then, however, you would expect the uh, increased structure to gradually dissipate as the issue falls off the agenda. But, of course, the issue has not fallen off the agenda in the case of uh, the uh, Brexit process. So I'm interested in the extent to which the impact of the referendum on certain aspects of the structure and character of public opinion has been perpetuated, maybe even increased, by the <laughs> consequent Brexit process. OK, now, it has to be said that I think that delivering a deal that was going to satisfy the British public 
was always going to be relatively difficult given the fact that he was having to negotiate with the European Union. Let me uh, 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 explain to you why. This is a couple of the questions about what people wanted out of Brexit that we've been tracking throughout the last two and a half years. And the first one is basically, um, I, I don't use any jargon, this is all in plain English, so this is essentially a question that says, should European Union companies be allowed to trade freely in the UK in return for British companies being able to trade freely within the European Union? So it tries to turn free trade into human. Um, but the crucial point that you will note is that basically there is virtual unanimity about maintaining free trade with the European Union. The vast majority of Leave voters want to have a free trade deal with the European Union. There isn't really any argument about this. However, of course, insofar as maintaining free trade with the European Union implies membership of the single market, According to the theology of the European Union, this means that therefore you have to accept freedom of movement. Herein lies the problem. Because what's also true, although it's diminished to a degree, is that a majority of voters in the UK agree with a proposition that basically says that migrants from the European Union who wish to come to the UK to live and work should have to apply to do so in exactly the same way as somebody from outside the European Union. In other words, this is certainly denying the idea that there should be any preference uh, for EU migrants. It implies control and application. It therefore implies not having freedom of movement. Now, you can decide a little bit whether the glass is half full or half empty, depending on your perspective. You know, it is true, as you can see, that the amount of agreement with that proposition has declined to a degree as compared with the position in the autumn of 2016, but it's still 60% of people in favour. And it's also the case that many a Remain voter also agrees with this proposition. So we did start off with a basic difficulty, which is that the structure of public opinion in the UK does not match the theology of the European Union. And it, it, it was therefore always going to be difficult to come up with something that uh, met the expectations of uh, the British public. Um, that said, um, maybe things still managed to go rather more spectacularly wrong than we might otherwise have anticipated. Now, um, it won't surprise you to hear that, on balance, the British public were never that enamoured of how well the European Union was handling the process. Um, they became a bit more sceptical by... Uh, the autumn of 2017, but actually thereafter haven't become any more critical than they were already. So the European Union's not come out of the process unscathed, but it didn't have that much reputation to defend in the, mo in the first place, um, but you know, things haven't got that much worse. In contrast, the, um, right, the UK government has managed to bomb rather badly. Back in the uh, 2017, uh, February 2017, up before Article 50 was triggered, uh, I mean, it's already the case that you know, more people thought it was handling things badly than thought it was handling things well. But as you will notice, it's gone down and down and down. That was one of the figures that journalists loved when we put this out on Tuesday. You know, only 7% of all voters in the UK think that the UK government has handled Brexit well, and 80% of people think that it's done so badly. But what perhaps is really striking about all of this is how the division between Leave and Remain voters on these subjects have, has gradually managed to disappear. Um, so, um, won't surprise you to hear that Leave voters have always tended to be rather more critical of the European Union's handling of Brexit than have Remain voters. Um, the orange line up there is the proportion of Leave voters who think that the, the EU has been handling Brexit badly, and they've become somewhat more critical. Indeed, you know, by the end of the process, basically 80% of Leave voters think that the European Union has not handled Brexit well. And in many cases, that's probably code for, yep, they tried to screw us. Um, but even amongst Remain voters, only around a half take that, uh, take that view. That said, 
Um, there's also been a slight increase in the proportion of Remain voters. I think the EU has done well. So on, the, on balance, the EU has emerged out of the process amongst Remain voters in no worse an odour than it was at the beginning. But amongst Leave voters, things do get somewhat worse. But when it comes to the UK government, you know, unsurprisingly, at the beginning of the process, Leave voters were more inclined to give the UK government the benefit of the doubt. <coughs> Excuse me. After all, the UK government was trying to deliver and negotiate the Brexit that they at least had voted for. So we should, you know, we would be surprised that Remain voters think that the UK government is doing uh, badly because they don't agree with the objective that the UK government is trying to pursue. But um, uh, Leave voters, as you might expect, have a great deal of sympathy. But notice how. Theresa May has managed to unite Leavers and Remainers in their view of how Brexit has been handled. We now have four and five of both groups, and essentially the gap between Leave and Remain on this criterion has narrowed uh, to the point where it has disappeared. Now, that said, arguably what's really important is how good or bad a deal we think we're getting. If you're kind of trying to think of a measure of whether Brexit's been a success or not, well, maybe the process was screwed up, but maybe the outcome was still fine. Well, let's have a look. Um, so okay, one of the questions we've been asking throughout the last two years is how good or bad a deal do you think the UK is going to get out of Brexit? We started off, as you might expect, given that we voted roughly 50-50, with almost as many people thinking we're going to get a good deal as reckoned we were going to get a bad deal. But pessimism about the Brexit process and the outcome of that process has gradually increased throughout the last two years. We had the misfortune that, in fact, when we last surveyed last year, it was just before checkers, and we know from other survey research that checkers did an awful lot of damage to people's confidence in the kind of deal that we were going to get. But anyway, we've now caught up, and as you can see, only 6% of people think that um, we are getting a good deal. So, you know, important to understand that one of the reasons why, at the end of the day, the House of Commons across the road has felt able to keep on rejecting the Prime Minister's deal is that even the, 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 the public as a whole have rejected that deal, um, and that therefore meant that the pressure on MPs to accept it has been much less than it would be, not least in particular because it is Leave voters above all who are now disappointed. Again, Prime Minister's united people, Leave voters are as unhappy with the deal as Remain voters. It was the Leave voters who started off relatively pessimistic, only, uh, optimistic, only around one in five of them thought we would have a bad deal, but now it's four in five. Um, and in fact, you know, if anything, Leave voters are very slightly more pessimistic than Remain voters. So in particular, you know, what, Brexiteer inclined Tory MPs have not been under pressure to pass this deal. And the Prime Minister's argument that her deal was the one and only way in which Brexit could be delivered inevitably looks open to question when the very voters whose instructions she says she is trying to implement have so uh, decisively rejected the deal. Um, and to that extent, at least, one has to say that this process has ended up being quite a remarkable failure. The blame for which is frankly laid at both sides of the negotiating table. Now, that said, however, there's one other thing that one should explain, um, uh, which is how, um, or examine, how important or unimportant is all of this so far as people's views about leaving Brexit in the first place? And, of course, what, and another important question we need to ask for the Brexit process if we're going to evaluate its success or failure is, well, is it the case that if we do end up leaving the European Union, Will this indeed represent the will of the democratic majority of people? So let me just go through one or two things here. So one of the things we've been tracking is people's views, expectations of what Brexit will mean in terms of consequences. 
Um, this is tracking what they uh, expected about immigration. We actually had a reading done just before the referendum. And as you can see, as compared with all before the referendum, the proportion of people who thought that immigration would fall uh, fell off quite markedly, quite quickly. But thereafter, basically, it hasn't changed. So we've got around 40% of people who expect immigration to fall. Hardly anybody expects it to increase. And the Brexit process has not really changed those expectations. On the other hand, when it comes to our views about the economic consequences of Brexit, which were never that optimistic in the first place, it was always the case during the referendum that more people thought that we would uh, 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 suffer economically as a result of Brexit than thought we'd be better off. Um, but it was around 40% of people who thought that we would be worse off. Uh, not the 50% that you need to win a referendum. But as you can see, it's you know, nothing like as dramatic as some of the trends I've been showing you so far, but not unimportant uh, no, for that. We've become somewhat more pessimistic about the economic consequences of Brexit, and indeed now very clearly, decisively, much more likely to think it's going to be bad for us than good for us. What perhaps is more, even more important is that that increase in pessimism has occurred almost entirely amongst those who voted Leave. Remainers were, you know, they've written off Brexit as a disaster, uh, you know, long ago. Um, and 80% of them still think it's going to be an economic uh, disaster. Most Remain voters still don't take that view. But as you can see, whereas at the beginning of the Brexit process, <coughs> excuse me, only around one in 10, thought that we would suffer economically, that figure now stands at one in four. And to that extent, at least, there is a somewhat more sanguine view about the economic consequences of Brexit amongst Leave voters. And it's something, the implications of which I will come back to in a moment. Have we changed our minds? Well, um, these are the numbers that we generated. So what I'm showing you here is how um, people say they would now vote based on how they voted in 2016. And we were able to ask people this, in many cases, not long after the referendum. First point to note, there is no doubt, no doubt at all, that most people who took, place, who took part in the 2016 referendum have not changed their minds, okay? That's one thing we have to understand. About 85% of people who voted in the 2016 referendum would do exactly the same thing again. That said, those who voted leave look as though they're a bit softer than those who voted remain. We've got not inconsiderable gap. Um, we've got 89% of Remainers saying they vote the same way compared with 79% of Leavers. If you take the average of recent um, opinion polls, the gap is rather narrow, but you can still see it there. And to that extent, at least, it looks as though there is a bit of a switch or a bit of a less loyalty amongst Leave voters. But you will also notice something else which is also crucial to the debate, and I think gives reason for both sides to pause and reflect as they continue to make assertion after assertion about where the British public stands. Because the group that, above all, in, it now seems to have been, become markedly pro-Remain are those who did not vote in 2016. I suspect, like me, you've lost count. Indeed, I, I think I heard it in the House of Commons again this afternoon. I've lost count of how many times I have been told that 17.4 million people voted leave in the biggest democratic uh, exercise this country has ever held. Well, the last bit, of course, is a load of nonsense because it's a 71% turnout, and it definitely isn't the highest turnout that we've had in this country. And by the way, the 85% in the Scottish Independence Referendum beats it hands down. Um, but, and secondly, of course, 17.4 million might sound like a big number, but actually it was only 52% of the electorate, and the honest truth is this country was, uh, was, was divided down the middle. It therefore doesn't take very much of a movement for this country potentially 
to have a different majority view. And there are enough people who did not vote in 2016, let alone those who are, were 16 and 17 at the stage, for them potentially to be able to tip the balance of opinion. What I think is interesting, because one of the things we've been able to do with our data is to track how those who did not vote in 2016, how their opinion has evolved. And if there's been a shift in British public opinion, that's where the shift has occurred. This group has become much more pro-Remain than they were two years ago. So the message to those on the Leave side has to be, well, maybe, maybe you are, are expressing what is still the view of the majority of the public. But you need to be aware that this is a subject about which we could have an honest debate. But equally on the Remain side, be aware that one of the foundations upon which your relatively narrow lead in the opinion polls rests is a bunch of people who couldn't be bothered two and a half years ago to turn out and vote, and there's no guarantee that they will necessarily do so again. Um, and the truth is that we are therefore still facing a difficult situation on trying to resolve this issue because we're basically still rather split down uh, the middle. Um, and again, you can see all of this in other recent polls. Um, this is where we end up as a result in the running poll of polls that we do. It's currently just whipped back up to 54 for Remain, 46 for Leave, but it's all relatively narrow. But it's, and it's not dramatically changed. It's been running at around between 52 and 54 for um, well over 12 months now. But why? Insofar as there has been some movement amongst Leave voters away from loyalty to the uh, Leave uh, uh, argument, why might they have changed their minds? Well, this, you know, this becomes fascinating. It goes to show you how you shouldn't get too uh, uh, taken up by process. On the left-hand side, I am comparing their views of the deal of those who say they would vote Leave again and those Leave voters who say they would not vote Leave again. And what you will notice is that there is no difference. So people's view of the deal and the outcome from that deal does not appear to be relevant to undermining people's support for the principle of Brexit. In other words, the deal is seen as a failure of implementation by Leavers rather than necessarily reason to question the principle. So again, those of you who may be in the Remain camp who think that this shambles is eventually going to persuade Leave voters that it's all a jolly bad idea, think again. They will simply say, we've got a bad deal, we should go off and get a better one. They are not going to say that Brexit is a bad idea in the first place. But then compare this with the right-hand side, where I'm comparing the views of these two groups on that item I showed you earlier about what will be the economic consequences of Brexit. And what you will notice is that those who are disloyal, i.e. they wouldn't vote Leave again, two-thirds of them now think that would be, we would be economically worse off, whereas amongst those who are loyal, the figure is only 15%. So that perception of the economic consequences of Brexit is a crucial driver for the turnover of support insofar as that turnover exists. <coughs> OK. Much more briefly, Catherine will be pleased to hear on the second half of what I've got to say. Um, this is much longer, much more complicated, and I'm going to go through it relatively briefly. Um, in order to be able to chart the long-term impact of the whole of the Brexit process on the structure of public opinion and, and how it shapes out, we can't use the referendum question, because the referendum question was not asked uh, in any survey, and we didn't know what the referendum question was going to be until September 2015. So um, in order to chart the long-term evolution of support for leaving the European Union, I'm having to use a question that we've asked regularly on British Social Attitudes since about the beginning of the 1990s. Um, and as you can see, it presents people with a much more uh, diverse set of options. But I'm just going to focus on the first one. But because there's a more diverse set of options, you will not get the very high levels of support for leave that were registered in the referendum. That said, you can still see that the referendum <laughs> left its mark on this measure in the early 1990s. So 1992, this is kind of before Maastricht, Jakob Kreutzhoff disease, 
uh, the increasing Euroscepticism of, of the Conservative Party begins to kick in. And while all the beneficial effects of Jack Delors worrying of the Labour Party was all with us. This is the, that 1992 is around the high point of our support for the European Union. Um, but it doesn't re really dramatically kick in until, well, we, get, we, we have, unfortunately, we have a gap in this series. But by the time that Nigel Farage is beginning to make a noise and David Cameron is getting, getting a bit nervous, uh, support for uh, staying in the <laughs> EU is much higher. And then you'll see the impact of the referendum even on our measure, which is support for the EU is uh, leaving the EU is still higher now than it was before this process started. So the long-term impact undoubtedly seems to have been to undermine support for EU membership. But what I'm really interested in is to use this measure to, first of all, to see whether or not differences of attitude have widened uh, since the Bre uh, before the Brexit process started. So here's an example of what I mean. This is looking at people's attitudes by age. Now you all know, because you've all been to these conferences millions of times, that uh, younger people were more likely to vote remain than older people more likely to vote to leave. So what I'm showing here is the support for leave by comparing the under 35s with the over 55s. And you will see, yes, even back in 2014, the older age group was somewhat more likely to be in favour of leaving the European Union. But you will see how during the course of the Brexit process, they, the two age groups have polarised. So the age gap now is sharper than it was when the Brexit process started. Um, there's a slightly more complicated story when it comes to education. Similar kind of analysis, just comparing those with a degree and those without. Um, edu any educational qualifications. The gap uh, did widen, particularly widen in 2016, although it's not necessarily been fully, fully sustained at that level since the, uh, during the course of the subsequent two years' worth of negotiations. But on the other hand, something else where the link has clearly become sharper um, uh, is the link with people's sense of European identity. We ask everybody, how strongly or weakly European do you feel? Most people, of course, don't feel very strongly European. But insofar as you know, there are people who have a strong sense of European identity, well, amongst this group, support for leaving the European Union is very low and continues to be low, whereas amongst those with a weak sense of European identity, that now translates much more likely into wanting to leave the European Union. And then finally, not least, as is now frankly reflected in lots of votes in the House of Commons, the uh, support base for the political parties has polarised, um, there wasn't that much difference before the referendum in the level of support for leaving amongst Conservative and Labour identifiers. The gap is now much wider. Some of this to do with resorting, um, uh, uh, i.e. Um, uh, people who uh, uh, like remain leaving the, con uh, leaving the Conservatives and people who like leave going into the Conservatives. Um, but um, you, as the result is a much more polarised political space around this. And obviously Paula spoke much more eloquently about this um, earlier. Um, there's then, however, a second aspect, which you know, I have to say straight away, Sarah Holbert and her colleagues were primarily responsible for uh, generating this idea. Uh, we've simply picked it up and tried to make sure that what she has said can be um, upheld. Um, so what Sarah and her colleagues have been arguing is to say, look, you know, you know all that stuff, stuff that political scientists go on about, about people having a so-called political I a party identity. They have a sense of emotional or affective attachment to a political party that means they say, I'm very strong Labour or very strong Conservative. And of course, you know all that political science literature that says that there are very few people left who feel that way. Well, you know what? I think that there are lots of people who now feel very strong Remainer or very strong Lever. And picking that idea up, one of the things that we've done both on the panel and now on British social attitudes is to, is to get at that idea, but systematically as possible, using the same questions that are used and have been used for years in order to measure party identity, particularly when it comes to the strength of identity. We've asked exactly the same question. It's very simple. Are you a very strong Remainer stroke lever, a fairly strong or not very strong? Um, we did it, first of all, on the panel, reported it last autumn, and we got about 44% of people saying that they were very strong Remainers. 
Question mark, however, is that that's not a fresh sample. These are people who are you know, slightly daft enough to keep on answering surveys. What do you get when a fresh cross-section sample of people who are perhaps not quite so politically committed? Well, the reassuring answer for Sarah and her colleagues is you get much the same answer. 40% of people in the latest British social attitudes identify as either a very strong remainer or a very strong lever. And if I tell you that in exactly the same survey in 2018, we've only got 8% of people who describe themselves as very strong conservative, very strong labor, or whatever, you will see the extent to which people's sense of commitment to either side of this debate is remarkably high. And we've not had those kind of levels of party identification in the UK since the 1960s. Um, but you then also have to bear in mind, common though they are, these people do have very distinctive views. They contribute to the polarisation that's going on in a, way, in a way that you will see. These are people whose views stand out quite remarkably, um, but you shouldn't mistake them for being typical. So... All those people who have been gloriously using the sun, uh, enjoying the sunshine this afternoon and on both sides of the argument, they definitely illustrate a passion that exists in the broader society, but the views that they express aren't necessarily typical of even fellow Remainers and Leavers, let alone anybody else. Let me quickly give you some idea of this. The fact that the European Union flag was being flown so widely on the People's Vote March, Saturday, uh, March last Saturday, lots of people picked up, yep, of course. But very strong Remainers are remarkably atypical in this country in having a strong sense of European identity. They are the only group, including as compared with those Remainers who aren't, or aren't so strong Remainer, as the only group who, where more people feel a strong sense of European identity uh, than have feel a weak one. So they are unusual in being strong Europeans. They're also unusual in that they're the only group who don't feel that European Union membership undermines Britain's ability to make its own laws. These are the folk for whom sovereignty is not an issue, but they are atypical. But equally, on the other side of the fence, those levers, the, the le very strong levers, are the only group where well over a half think that the economic consequences of Brexit are going to be beneficial. And equally, they're the only group where only half of people think that Britain influence in the world is going to be increased by leaving the European Union. So to that extent, at least, just be aware that those who are the most ardent and strongest supporters on both sides, that their views are not necessarily reflective of the wider public. <laughs> Still, um, all of that. Short headline, the Brexit process has been a failure so far. And two, however, it has polarised us quite dramatically. It's perhaps helped to stimulate political engagement, but I guess some people might say... Be careful what you wish for. Thanks very much. We have to take questions. Yeah, of course. Um, so John's very kindly um, agreed to take questions. Can I have a sense of who would like to ask questions? So I'll start. There's a gentleman there. Um, gentleman in the front row. Uh, start with those two. Gentleman there in the grey suit. Uh, and then the gentleman at the back, if you could get the mic to him. So, uh, gentleman there, and then afterwards, gentleman at the back. Go ahead. Uh, we saw in uh, June, June the 23rd, 2016, uh, that the, the polls that had been showing a reasonably strong uh, pro-EU lead you know, collapsed to, to, to 48%. Is there any reason to judge whether the lead that Remain has today in if, if we came to a second referendum, whether that lead might hold up more or it's just as vulnerable as it was? Sorry. Um, well, look, the first thing to realise about... Um, I mean, the, the, the polls taken about um, Remain versus Leave, uh, 
uh, or indeed all polling about Brexit, now has an advantage that the polls did not have in 2016, and that is that they are virtually all of them weighted so that uh, the distribution of reported 2016 vote matches what happened in the actual Brexit referendum. Uh, one of the difficulties facing the polls in 2016 was that they did not have that kind of anchor, which has now become com commonplace in the polling industry. I mean, that said, there is still quite a, a, a substantial variation in the pollsters in how they weight uh, the level of non-voting. And as I have shown you, the uh, views of non-voters are very distinctive and that therefore the headline figures that polls will come up with will be sensitive to how many non-voters they decide to include in our sample. Uh, the second thing, uh, of course, to say, I, I, so I didn't fully hear all the text of what you said, but let's just remind people that a, a majority of the opinion polls conducted during the EU referendum said that uh, Leave were ahead. And why anybody thought it was darned obvious that the Leave side that Remain was going to win, I do not know. It was very poor intelligence and very poor understanding of the polling. Um, I think the honest truth is that people in 2016, many people were betting against the polls on the grounds that they'd, they'd heard this uh, uh, in a simplification of the academic literature, which is that people um, uh, uh, run away from uh, the status quo, run, run towards the status quo towards the end of a major constitutional referendum on the grounds that they are concerned uh, about, they, they become risk averse. Well, actually, the literature is more complicated than that, and it doesn't always happen. Uh, and, and in this case, it evidently uh, you know, did not. Um, but you know, obviously, what one has to say you know, thereafter is any referendum that might get held in future will get held after a campaign has been conducted. And it's sufficiently close. And it's sufficiently, and the outcome may well rest sufficiently on those who did not vote in 2015, 2016, that the campaigning will matter. And it depends on who has the better arguments. You know, the Leave campaign definitely won the last uh, referendum campaign. Uh, the question is whether the Remain campaign can do a better fist of it second time around or not. Okay, thank you. So I'll take a couple of questions and let you answer them. So the gentleman there, then there's a gentleman over there who shall have the mic. There's a lady at the very back with her hand up. There's been the next two. So go on, gentlemen. Yeah, my name is Chris Maffidon. I just wanted to find out, uh, because immediately after the Scottish referendum, Alex Salmon said one thing about opinion polls and re re uh, results of referendum. The, the huge disparity between... Um, what you get when you ask people questions to what they do when it comes to voting. No, there is no uh, huge disparity. It's nonsense. So, so uh, why was it that all the predictions pre-Brexit did not aggregate to suggest that well, the, big, the, the big, was... I'll, just, I'll, t I'll take a couple of questions. Okay, quickly, all right. quite a lot. So the gentleman there, uh, there's a gentleman at the back then, and then the lady, and then I'll t let you answer. Uh, Rob Blackie. Uh, when we look at the Leave Re Remain polls using a 2016 question, we currently have about 54, 46. Yeah. But if we look at Remain versus May's deal or Remain versus No Deal, yeah. I think any other pairing I've seen, it's more like 60, 40 for Remain. Yeah. Is this just people being psychologically committed to the decision they made in 2016 and therefore backward framing needs to yeah, yeah, yeah. that, or is there something else going on? Yeah, yeah, no, okay, right, thank you. Um, I think it's the lady at the back. Um, th thank you. Anne Singleton, University of Bristol. Um, I'd be interested if you were able to identify in the results the um, voters or the people in the poll who are EU citizens in the UK or any idea of the, um, the views about the effects on the 5 million with the 2 million UK citizens in the EU. Okay. Okay. Um, Three minutes to answer three right, minutes. Right, right, okay, right. Um, uh, the, the, the predictions, I th well, the, insofar as the predictions were poor in 2016, I mean, for the most part, my view is people looking through the, looking through the polls through rose-tinted glass, rose glasses. I mean, there was that disparity between phone and, 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 and internet polls for quite a while, and basically there was a tendency for people to say, oh, look, it must be the phone polls that are right because people won't be daft enough to vote to leave the European Union. Um, the other thing to bear in mind, is, uh, it, the other thing I think did go on, I mean, if you, if you follow the detailed methodology of the polls during the EU referendum, they kept on 
uh, tweaking and tweaking and tweaking for perfectly honourable, uh, uh, perfectly open, defensible reasons. But the, for the most part, the impact of their tweaks was to keep on bumping up the Remain vote. And I think there was a, an understandable tendency within the polling industry to say that if we're going to call this for leave, we better be right. Because if we call it for leave and we are wrong, that you know, all hell and fury is going to be visited upon us as having uh, misled the, what was going to going on. And I think there was an asymmetry of risk for the polling industry uh, about uh, getting it wrong. Um, on, uh, you're quite right, polls that ask... Uh, Remain versus May's deal. Actually, it's not 60-40. It tends to be somewhere around 57-58 in favour of uh, Remain. The difficulty with those is that what you, you will see if you look at the detailed tables is that such questions get a relatively high level of don't knows amongst those who voted leave because, of course, we know that around at least 50% of leave voters would prefer no deal to deal. And uh, to that extent, at least, when you present them in an opinion poll with that choice, they go, I don't like that choice. But I, I think the best advice would be that in the end, if we were to have a referendum on Mrs May's deal versus Remain, and I think that's the only referendum that feasibly can happen, because I don't think the European Union will allow anything else to happen, um, it, it is that in the end, the Leavers will fall in behind Mrs May's deal in much the same way as many of them have done uh, today. Um, uh, frankly, I have no data on European Union citizens at all. OK, thank you. I'll do, take one last round. There was a gentleman over there gentleman in the middle row and a uh, gentleman about two rows behind. So, uh, Mike, over there, please. OK, thank you so much for your talk. Um, do you have any good news about Britain coming together? Um, <laughs> thank you. I, I was thinking, for example, when, when we get actual events in the real world, as opposed to persuasion and re-smog, um, like car factories closing or GDP not going up or EasyJet going to Austria, does that affect the, will these real life events change everything? Um, okay, thank you. Um, very, who's got the mic? There's a a very quick methodological yeah, quest you, question. <coughs> Do you at any point ask voters if they understand what they mean by no deal? Because quite a lot of the anecdotal information suggests that quite a few people and quite a few MPs aren't too sure. Okay, thank you. Gentleman there. Could you talk a bit more about why the gap between young and old is widening, do you think, and how <laughs> demographics and sort of the attitudes of the young are going to affect the polling? I mean, you, you, the people who identify closely with, uh, among the Rain Group uh, uh, with EU, I mean, are they predominantly younger people? Sorry, who, uh, what was your last point? Are, are the people who uh, have strong European okay. identities, would they be yeah. younger people and does that signal a sort of okay. generational shift in attitudes in the UK? Okay. Um, right. I, 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 the first question, I wasn't entirely clear where you were heading. I thought when you said, is there any sign of Britain coming together, you know, was there any sign of us reaching an agreement about what kind of Brexit we wanted and what we wanted to happen? To which the answer is definitely no. The two most popular options are either leaving without a deal or having a referendum with the hope and expectation that we will change our minds. And there ain't much in between, which is why forging a Brexit compromise is difficult. But then you seem to be going on to talk about, quote, real-life events. Well, I mean, I, I mean insofar as... Uh, people might begin to come to the view that Brexit is economically disadvantageous. I've shown you how that potentially is a force that could change uh, the level of support for leaving. But, uh, it, and, you know, there's some of it's happened, but, you know, not that much of it yet so far. Um, uh, do they, uh, I mean, I, I'm aware that there has been argument about this, and to be honest, I've not really engaged in the extent to which people say, um, uh, you know, do they or do they not understand um, what, um, uh, what we mean by no deal, etc. Um, I mean, I will just simply make two points. There, there is, um, uh, has been some research done as part of this initiative which has looked more broadly at comparing the levels of knowledge of, about the EU of Remain and Leave voters, and it has failed to identify a difference. And secondly... Uh, insofar as there is a bit of a myth, a bit of a stereotype out there as to how Leave voters are all driven by emotion and Remain voters are all wonderfully cognitively rational people. I have to tell you that it's on the Remain side that the strong emo emotional attachment 
is the stronger. Uh, so I, you know, I think you know, the, 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 you know that, that it's not true. Um, why is the gap widened? Well, the first thing to say is that it's not the case that younger voters are the most strongly committed Remainers. Uh, one of the interesting things about the structure of Brexit identity is that it is actually very similar to the structure of party, identif party identity. It's long, long been a finding in political science that younger voters are less likely to have a strong sense of attachment to a party than our older voters. And the same is true of Brexit. So even though, as a group, Remainers are particularly likely to have a wrong, very strong sense of identity, and although the Remain group is, 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 is rather younger, however, it's still the case that uh, young people themselves are not particularly very strong uh, 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 sense of Brexit identity. Why is the gap widened? Well, <coughs> you can read the chapter that... I was quickly summarising towards the end there in more greater detail. But what it, what, it, what it goes on to show is how the structure, the, the relationship between people's views about Europe and their various views about uh, uh, various aspects of public policy and the consequences of Brexit have become more closely aligned. And, you know, and that includes immigration. So the, the relationship between people's attitudes towards immigration and their support for the European Union is that that relationship is now much tighter than it once was. Um, and of course, younger people are much less concerned about immigration than older people. After all, it's younger people that migrate and older people who are, to whom migrate, uh, it's to, uh, older people are, it's the group to whom migration happens. Are you done? Hmm? You finished? Yeah, I finished, Marvelous. yeah. <laughs> well, I think at that moment we need to draw it to a close. Um, as I said to you at the beginning, John Kirst is, is wonderful and he has duly delivered on that. Um, I'd like you to join me in thanking him very warmly for giving us the benefit of his time. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>